Next concept here is electrochemical cells. So you can see there's two types. We've got voltaic cells and electrolytic cells. And, and what cells means is not like the little living thing that our bodies are made out of, but, but oftentimes we refer to batteries as cells in chemistry. And so we have two types here. One is spontaneous. The voltaic cell is a spontaneous reaction and an electrolytic cell is a non-spontaneous reaction. We're going to hit up examples for both types and get you on your way. So the first thing I wanted to point out was the setup of these cells. So here's a voltaic cell and actually the voltaic cell has two different types of uh, setups that they could be in. So we've got the salt bridge setup, which is this diagram right here. And then we've got the porous cup setup that is this diagram over here. Now what you'll see underneath is something that we call cell notation. And this just shows on paper what the voltaic cell will look like and what electrodes are which, what solution is it sitting in. Um, so there's a few terms that you need to know as it relates to voltaic cells and how they're set up. First thing that I like to, to do in terms of identifying voltaic cells is does it have a voltmeter or not? If it has a voltmeter, then that's a voltaic cell. So you can see both these diagrams have a voltmeter hooked up to them. So there it is. Another term that you need to know if you don't remember from junior high when we did a little bit about this in, in Science 9 are electrodes. And what electrodes are is just a, a, a chunk of mostly metals. Sometimes it can be a non-metal like carbon, but it's just a substance that will conduct electricity uh, or an electric current so that the circuit can be completed and these electrons can flow through this entire setup. So that's the electrode. The electrolyte is just a solution that contains ions. So in this beaker here, we're gonna have an electrolyte. This beaker here, we have an electrolyte. You can see in this porous cup example that I've, I've labeled everything from the cell notation into the actual diagram. And so right here, you can see this is all stuff that is connected into one area. So this is what I've, I've put into the porous cup. You can see my electrode is copper and that's sitting in copper sulfate solution. So copper two ions and SO4 two minus ions. Remember that those are soluble in water so that's why we dissociate them into their ions. Over here in the beaker on the outside is the zinc electrode with the zinc ions and the nitrate ions just found right here. This double line in cell, in cell notation either represents the salt bridge or the porous cup depending on what setup you decide to draw. Um, you will see both types of setups in questions that are given to you. Something else to note as well is this porous cup right here is just that. It's porous. So it's got little holes in them and this allows for ions to move and we'll talk about what that means exactly in terms of where the ions are moving and stuff like that as we get further into the example. But that's what this porous cup is, is all about, is things will start to move back and forth as that electric current uh, is generated through the spontaneous reaction. So we're going to look at this example in a little bit more detail. And I'll have this labeled, all of these things labeled into this diagram as we move on. And let's get started. So here's the example of a voltaic cell and how it's been labeled. You can see I've put in the, the different uh, substances that were in the cell notation down here. Uh, all you really need to look at here and, and see what correlates is that uh, right here, I've got everything on in, in this beaker and then everything on this side of the salt bridge goes in this beaker. The two things that are on the end are my electrodes right here And the two things in the middle are my electrolytes. So this just helps you understand how things go into the beaker and, and how things get set up. So now that we've got it set up, uh, what you need to understand now is that all of these substances here are all connected. And because they're all connected, 
due to this salt bridge connecting them and, and this voltmeter and having this sort of circuit-like type of system, we now can, uh, we can, now, we now can write a, a species listed for this uh, because we know that in a, a chemical reaction for redox reactions, only the strongest oxidizing agent is going to react with the strongest reducing agent. And so that's what this list is up here. This is a list of all the species that are present in this voltaic cell. And I've identified for you, you can see which one is the strongest reducing agent, which one is the strongest oxidizing agent. And I, I did that using the data booklet and the reduction half reaction table that's, that's in there. So now once I know what the oxidizing agent and, re and reducing agent is for, for these substances that, that, that have been listed, I know which thing is being reduced and which thing is being oxidized. So my oxidizing agent is being reduced, so I'm going to write a reduction half reaction for that substance. And so you can see the reduction half reaction there, complete with its electrical potential, its reduction electrical potential over there on the right. The reducing agent is my zinc electrode, zinc solid, and so this is my uh, oxid oxidation half reaction. Zinc solid is being oxidized, so I must write an oxidation half reaction for that. And you can see that I've written its oxidation potential for that. In the booklet, it reads as 0.76 negative, and uh, that's for its reduction half reaction. So because this is an oxidation, it's the opposite. I gotta flip the sign. So I canceled the electrons, and you can see I wrote my balanced redox reaction there. It's pretty simple. And next beside it is also the net electrical potential of 1.10 volts. So what I've got now is I've got some rules here that I have to follow uh, for electrochemical cells. And th this is for both voltaic cells and electrolytic cells. These five rules are just that, they're rules. And uh, each of these cells, both voltaic and electrolytic, will follow these five rules. And you'll see many questions where they ask you to identify on diagrams or by using numbers, a numerical response, for example, or something like that. And you'll see lots of questions like this in the practice booklets that I've handed out to you, uh, where these five rules have to be identified on the diagram. So in other words, what is the cathode? What's the anode? How do the electrons flow? And how do the anions and cations flow? In which direction? And so um, what I can do is use these rules. So first of all, gain of electrons, which is reduction, and we know that, that occurs at the cathode. So where in this beaker is reduction occurring? Well, I take a look at what's being reduced, and that's my copper ions, Cu2 positive. So I just come over here to my diagram, and I find where in the diagram are the copper 2 ions found. And so I find them here, and this is the only place that they're found. And so this is where the place where reduction is going to be occurring. These copper 2 positive ions will be gaining two electrons. And so... Uh, what this means is the electrode that's sitting in that solution, in that electrolyte, where that is occurring, that is going to be my cathode. So copper is, copper solid is my cathode. Now you'll notice that copper solid is not one of the reactants, that doesn't matter. It's just where is reduction occurring? It's occurring in this beaker, this is the electrode that's in that beaker, so that's the cathode. Now. What you need to know is happening here is because these copper ions are going to be gaining two electrons, they're actually going to become copper solid. And you can see that here in the balanced reaction over here on the right. And so these copper two positive ions become copper solid. And what actually ends up happening is those copper ions, they start to fill, uh, build up uh, an excess amount of copper on that copper electrode. Um, and, and so as this reaction runs over time, you can see that this, the mass of this cathode actually increases. For the second rule, loss of electrons is oxidation. This occurs at the anode. Now, this is pretty easy in that if this is the cathode, then this has to be the anode. Uh, but we do know that zinc solid is being re uh, oxidized here. Uh, it's the reducing agent, and so because it's being oxidized, we know that it is the anode.
And so for this one, because zinc is actually losing two electrons, it's becoming zinc two positive. This zinc electrode actually starts to corrode away. And so over time, the mass of the zinc electrode actually decreases. And uh, this is why oftentimes, or one reason why batteries die is that the anode, the, the, one of the electrodes in that battery eventually gets so oxidized that it actually isn't sitting in the solution anymore and there's a break in the circuit and so then the battery's dead. Um, but this takes time to, to happen and so, but the mass does decrease over time as this battery runs. Now step number three is telling us which way do the electrons flow. So we know the electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. Usually it's just labeled like this. The electrons are flowing in that direction. So we can label it on the diagram like that. And then lastly, the last two, fairly simple, cations will flow to the cathode. That kind of seems to go together and anions flow to the anode. And so my anions will flow in this direction this guy will go up through the salt bridge and this way. And my cations will flow to the cathode. Like that. And so now on the diagram, we've labeled these five rules of what's happening in this cell. And um, that's what you need to know about voltaic cells. I'm going to do another example and I'll be right back. So here's the last example for voltaic cells. Uh, you can see here I've got the cell notation up on the top and then I've labeled everything in the diagram down below and then I've listed my species present for this chemical cell so that I can identify my strongest oxidizing agent and my strongest reducing agent. So oftentimes what you'll see in questions is they will give you just this diagram and they'll label things in and then they'll ask you a bunch of questions. A number of questions they could ask. They could ask you any one of those five rules so which way do the electrons flow? Which, way, which one's the cathode? Which one's the anode? Or they could ask all five. Or they could ask you, what's the balanced chemical reaction that comes from this? And so there's a number of things that you should be able to do as it relates to identifying information with voltaic and, and electrolytic cells. So here's my species listed. You can see I've picked out which ones are being oxidized and which one's being reduced and written the half reactions over here. I've balanced the electrons out, canceled them out, and written the balanced equation. What you can also see here is that the net electrical potential, again, is positive, as it was in the previous example. And this matches with what we know about voltaic cells in that voltaic cells are spontaneous redox reactions. The last thing I want to point out with this example is that you can see here I've got a carbon electrode. And so we have two types of electrode, or two electrodes that are considered a, sort of a special type of electrode. And they're called... inert electrodes. And the two substances that act as inert electrodes are carbon and platinum. So you'll see them labeled like this. All this means is when they're inert, it just means that they are not taking any part in the reaction that's occurring. They're just there as filler to allow the electrons to flow and complete the circuit. And so even though you'll find in this reaction, for example, you can see that carbon solid is not found in this reaction in terms of the reactants or the products, uh, it's still labeled as the cathode. And this is the cathode because reduction is occurring with these two substances right here, reduction is occurring in this beaker. And so because reduction is occurring in this beaker, this uh, chunk of substance that's conducting the electricity through, that's the cathode. That makes this the anode, which means the electrons are going to flow in this direction from anode to cathode. The anions are going to flow to the anode and the cath cations are going to flow to the cathode. Uh, in the two examples that I've done here, it's just merely coincidental that the cathode ended up being on the left. You can have the cathode on the right. It all depends on how it was set up. If I had stuck all of these things in the electrolyte over here and these ones over here, then this would have been the cathode and this would have been the anode. 
You just have to identify where is reduction occurring and then that's the cathode. And then you know the other electrode has got to be the anode because there's only ever going to be two electrodes in these examples. All right, we're back with electrolytic cells. And uh, the thing that you need to remember about electrolytic cells, if you remember earlier on in the video, is that they are a non-spontaneous reaction. The main thing that electrolytic cells are used in is electroplating metals. And so <clears throat> here's an example of uh, how you could electroplate something. Uh, electrolytic cells are always hooked up to a power source. And so this is how you distinguish it from a voltaic cell. Voltaic cells are always hooked up to a voltmeter. Electrolytic cells are always hooked up to a power source. Uh, so you can see that this power source is just some, some kind of battery or something you plug into the wall that provides electrons for this reaction. And you can see that it's in an, electro, uh, an electrolyte solution of copper 2 sulfate. So we've got copper ions and, and sulfate ions. Over here, we've got our, our quarter that we're going to electroplate using uh, this solution to plate it with copper. And then a, an inert electrode over here, just a, a chunk of graphite. So I, I've listed my species present. Again, I, this list is a lot smaller than some of the other ones that we've done. And then I've looked up my, in my booklet and identified what my strongest oxidizing agent is and my strongest reducing agent. Then I've written those two half reactions down here below. My reduction half reaction for my oxidizing agent because it's being reduced. My oxidation half reaction for my reducing agent because it's being oxidized. And then I canceled out the electrons, made sure that they were balanced and wrote out the full balanced redox reaction. You can see also I've included the um, electrical potentials for each half reaction. You can double check those to make sure that I've done those right. And then done the math here and this ends up being a negative 0.89 volts. Again, this fits with electrolytic cells. Remember we said they're non-spontaneous, so we would expect that the net electrical potential that punches out for this reaction would be negative, and it is. And the negative number tells us that it is non-spontaneous, so that's good, that matches. Uh, and then I can use those five rules again to identify things within this diagram. So remember that reduction occurs at the cathode, and so because the copper two positive ions are being reduced, they are going to uh, be reduced at the cathode. And so our quarter is uh, the cathode in this, in this case. Uh, the, then the other electrode here is my anode because that's where oxidation is going to occur. And um, my electron flow moves from anode to cathode. So this is the way the electrons are gonna flow. And then my anions will flow to the, cath to the anode and the cations will flow to the cathode. And this is where the electroplating occurs. So as these copper ions move towards this quarter, and as the electrons move towards the quarter, this is where the reduction is gonna take place. And then that's where these copper ions become copper solid, and it plates a layer of copper metal onto the, onto the quarter or whatever it is that you might be electroplating. Could be a key, could be any, any sort of metal that you'd stick in there that you wanted to plate with copper, you could do that. And uh, I guess just as long as you're not picking an oxidizing agent that's stronger than copper. So that would be one stipulation for that. And so that's it. Uh, there's lots of different things that, that we can plate with different metals. Uh, you've heard of chrome plating before. Uh, we'll look at some examples of that in the next video as we look at uh, Faraday's law, so look for that one. And uh, one more example that you need to be aware of uh, as, as we talk about electrolytic cells is this special situation of uh, the electrolysis of brine solution. So if you've ever heard of brining a turkey, that just means the turkey sits in salt water. So when we're talking about the electrolysis of, of brine, we're just talking about hooking up uh, some salt water electrolyte to two inert electrodes and hooking it up to a power source and, and then letting that run. Now the reason why there's a power source here is because remember these are non-spontaneous reactions. So essentially what we're doing is we're forcing the electrons to move in a direction that they don't want to go. Uh, if we just let it sit naturally it's going to do nothing because it's non-spontaneous as we've said. But if we push those electrons and give them, it's like pushing a ball up a hill. We could, get, we could get it to do it, it just won't do it on its own. And so that's what's happening here. Uh, same thing with this one. This is again an electrolytic cell, so electrolysis of brine. 
uh, you can see that I've listed out my species present here and I've identified my strongest oxidizing agent and my strongest reducing agent as per the chart. Now the interesting thing here with this one as you probably have seen is how can water be the strongest oxidizing agent and the strongest reducing agent? Is water reacting with itself? My life experience doesn't really tell me that that's the case. And you're right, water doesn't react with itself. And uh, this is for some strange reason, and we don't know why this occurs. Uh, actually, water is not the strongest reducing agent in this reaction. Uh, it is the one that's lower on the chart, but for some, for some reason, chloride ions is the reducing agent in this, in this reaction. And if you find it on the chart in, in the reduction half reaction table, you'll notice that it's a little bit higher on the chart than water is. So everything that we've learned so far to this point would tell us, hey, chlorine, the chloride ions is not going to be the strongest reducing agent because it's, a, it's a little bit higher on the chart. But it's just the way that it works. It sort of breaks the rule that we've been learning so far to this point. And we call this the chloride anomaly. And we just don't fully understand why this, why this happens. All we know is that it does happen. And so... <clears throat> If you, this is just something you have to memorize as well. You need to know this rule. So when we start jumping into assessments for this unit and things like that, you will be tested on this concept of the chloride anomaly. And so whenever you see the electrolysis of brine solution, that needs to trigger something in your mind that says, okay, yeah, this, is, follow, this follows this chloride anomaly. So I've got to make sure that the chloride ions are my strongest reducing agent for, for the reaction that I'm going to write down. So... Uh, I didn't write out the reduction or the oxidation half reaction for this. I want you to do this on your own. But to check your answer, you should also calculate uh, the electrical potential, the net electrical potential for this reaction. And so again, because it's an electrolysis, an electrolytic cell, we know that it should be a negative number. The answer is negative 2.19 volts. So if you're picking the right half reactions and you're adding them up to together properly, and you're canceling out electrons and, and writing the balanced reaction, you should get this number. And uh, if you've got any questions, you can let me know. That's it, guys, for electrochemical cells. Uh, hopefully this was helpful, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.